Good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to this Resolution Foundation webinar. My name is Torsten Bell. I'm the Chief Executive of the Foundation. Now, one of the things, and there are many things, but one of the things the pandemic has taught us is how closely connected health and economics are. Because in the end, we've had the deepest recession, annual recession anyway, in 300 years because of a health crisis, not because of an economic crisis per se. But in lots of ways, it shouldn't have taken a huge, great crisis to teach us that because all of us in our lives know that we don't work particularly well when we are ill. And actually, a growing body of research before the crisis showed us the connections between mental health in particular and uh, the economy and individuals' ability to engage in the economy, but also the collective um, success of that economy. So that's what we want to talk about today, the connection between mental health uh, and the labour market, particularly for young people, because that, for a number of reasons, as we're going to come on to in a second, that's where we are. We are focusing, and to do that, we're publishing a new report today, which is a launch paper for a new project on young people in an insecure world. And we're going to, first of all, hear from Rukman Semi, who is the author of that report and is going to give you a selection of the findings in it. She's a senior research and policy analyst at the foundation. Uh, then you're going to hear from Alistair Campbell, who you may have heard of, who worked for some prime ministers back in the day when he wasn't writing diaries. And this week has been performing on TV and announcing the death of the Queen or something, which you can come and explain later. Uh, uh, Alistair, but along with all of that, he's managed to be a long-term campaigner on issues around um, mental health. And after him, you're going to hear from uh, Louise Arsenault, who is the Professor of Development Psychology at King's College uh, London and has been working on these issues long before the Resolution Foundation, so she can uh, educate us all um, about that. She also boasts the world's largest selection of plants in an office that I have seen during the course of this pandemic. And if nothing else, that deserves some major kind of prize. Now, as always, you can engage and ask questions on Slido, and there's also a poll up there uh, now for you to vote on. The hashtag is Hidden Crisis on there. So that is the plan for today. And it will come to your questions in the second half of the event once we've heard from our speakers. So to kick us off, I'm going to hand over to Rookman. Over to you. Thank you, Torsten. I'm just going to share my screen. Great. Okay, thank you, everyone for joining us today. Um, and welcome to our launch of our three year program, um, which is going to be looking at young people's labour market and mental health outcomes. A uh, huge thanks to my co-author, Hannah Slaughter, a Resolution Foundation. She's done a blinding job on this particular project. Um, so today we're talking about Double Trouble, which was published today. Uh, we're going to be looking at pre-crisis trends, how are young people faring during the crisis, and what can we expect for them um, coming out of the crisis? So the first question really is, why young people? Of course, we've all had a horrendous time during this crisis. Many people have not had the resources they need. Why should we focus on this particular group? Well, it's a key life stage. Young people, uh, you know, they're moving out of home for the first time, they're transitioning from education to work, um, and it is a key developmental period for them. Um, we know as well that poor labour market experiences when young can have a very profound impact later on. Even short periods of unemployment can cause a scarring effect later in life in terms of loss of income and long-term unemployment, to name but a few. Um, and in terms of mental health, there's also uh, a, a real uh, problem with if we don't act early, because most mental health problems develop when young. So if we don't intervene, uh, they may prevent, progress to a more severe uh, problem and also their detrimental impacts in other areas of the person's life. And of course, the two interact. They're a complex relationship and they're bi-directional. Uh, people who have mental health problems are much more likely to be unemployed and, and vice versa. So th these relationships are complex and we will unpick them further, but in this report, we will start to give you just a little flavor of what we're going to be looking at in these two areas. So the most important takeaway I think is we've got to get it right when people are young so they have a strong foundation. So first I'm gonna take you through the before crisis trends, because obviously this crisis has not happened in a vacuum. You know, young people have been hit hard, but there are reasons why that's the case. And we can look back to the previous financial crisis to really unpick why. So if we look at the overtime trends from 2000 through to 2018-19 for mental health, um, we can see, if you look at the blue line, which is young people, 18 to 24, that over time, there's been a really uh, stark increase for this particular group rising from 24% in 2000 who have a mental health problem to 30% in 
2018-19. So when I say mental health problem, I'm referring to common mental disorders, which is typically different forms of anxiety and depression. So there's been quite a large rise over time compared to other groups. And then if we look at 2018-19, we can see that the, this group has the highest rates out of all other groups just in the year preceding the crisis. So they were already facing um, this epidemic or crisis prior to um, the COVID-19 crisis. And then when we turn to insecure work, this is also um, a, a change over time that we've seen coming out of the financial crisis um, in 2008. And insecure work has, you know, it can be a good thing for some people. Some people prefer the flexibility. Um, but for young people, we can see there's been a very large change over time from 2000 through to 2018-19. So the share of young people in insecure types of work has really increased over time and particularly accelerated since the financial crisis in, in 2008. Um, this growth is driven by particularly agency work and zero hours contracts. Um, so this is the type of work that young people were in just on the eve of the crisis. So one in four were in this type of work, which is, is quite a large rate. And as I said, this program is all about bringing these two aspects together. And so, what do we know about insecure work and mental health prior to the crisis is that certainly being employed in any type of work is a good thing for mental health. The rates are much lower than being unemployed where four in 10 had a mental health problem. However, if you have any, if you're in any type of insecure work, um, particularly zero hours contract work, the rate is much higher. So over one in three had a mental health problem um, if they were in a zero hours contract job. So this even is in before the crisis, we can see that there's a, a huge risk factor here in terms of being in an insecure job in terms of mental health problems. So now considering that rising trend in insecure work, rising mental health problems in this group, these are the circumstances that they've come into the crisis, what, how have they fared? So if we look at the overtime trends during the crisis. So as I pointed out, 30% of young people prior to the crisis had a mental health problem. April 2020, very large increase to 50%. So one in two young people between the ages of 18 to 24 had a mental health problem. So over time, we can see that younger age groups overall, 25 to 34 year olds, 35 to 44 year olds, all tend to have these higher rates, but the youngest, 18 to 24, there's a greater volatility over time, rates falling over the summer, but then rising again in November 2020. We don't know what the reasons are for this at this point, it's something we will unpick, um, but it's potentially because this group has uh, a large proportion of students and perhaps they've had more disruption uh, in terms of access to education uh, and participation, which may have affected this volatility. But this of course is just a, a suggestion, we will unpick this further. And then, as many of you know, um, Resolution Foundation has shown that a very large proportion of young people have experienced an employment hit that could be furloughing, losing their job or losing pay. And a whopping one in five have lost their job who were employed in February 2020. So we've got these rising mental health problems and high levels of job loss um, in this group during the crisis. So again, we put the two together. Um, and as we can see, that one in three young people who lost their job in the last year rated their mental health as being poor. Um, furloughing did buffer this effect to some extent. So even though this was a, 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 a program designed to help people save their jobs, it also perhaps helped their mental health. Um, but 36% in terms of losing a job or their falls in pay, much more likely to have a mental health problem. So it's good news in terms of furlough, but unfortunately not for those who lost their job. And then if we turn to those who were in insecure work, so these people, they have lost their job at a disproportionately higher rate. 36% um, who were in insecure work in February 2020, before the crisis, have now gone on to lose their job. And 17% have lost pay. So there is some risk in terms of being in insecure work coming into the crisis. Um, in terms of losing your job. 
And then when we look at those who are in secure work and their mental health, they may well have retained their jobs, but unfortunately, they're still more likely to have mental health problems. So over one in three had a mental health problem. So they've, they've remained in work in January 2021, but uh, at high risk of mental health problems, equivalent to those who are unemployed, um, which is quite concerning. Um, and so, yes, that's definitely a, a worrying sign in terms of the, the nature of the work young people are doing and what that does to their mental health. Possible explanation could be that they were anticipating that they might lose their job. They knew that these sectors were unstable and perhaps therefore that caused the mental health problem. Um, but again, this is something we will unpick in our programme of work. So after that rather depressing um, a selection of facts, what can we do looking to the future? Well, um, we can look back to the previous financial crisis and maybe this can give us some idea of what could be expected. So this chart shows us the unemployment rate over time by age. And you can see in 2010, 2011, around one in four 18 to 21 year olds were out of work in the wake of the financial crisis. If we turn to mental health, how is this related? So we took, uh, took a new approach and looked at those who were employed in 2010, 2011, and split out whether they had a mental health problem or not. Those who had a mental health problem yet were in work in 2010, 2011, 14% of them, four years later, were out of work. Compared to those who had no mental health problem and were employed in 2010, 2011, four years later, only 8% were out of work. So I think this is really quite an alarming finding. Of course, this crisis is different. It has unique challenges, but it does tell us if we don't act now in terms of the mental health problems people are experiencing, even if they have retained their jobs, we may have further problems down the line. So in terms of the key takeaways, um, we have young people going into the crisis with some vulnerability, deteriorating mental health and higher rates of insecure working. And then during the crisis, they experience the biggest hits out of all other age groups, much more likely to lose their jobs. Uh, those in insecure work, much more likely to lose their jobs and a much larger share with mental health problems which have persisted over time. And then in terms of risks for the future, we have to deal with those who have mental health problems now because the lessons from the past tell us that they may be the ones who lose their job several years down the line. And then what can policy do? So we say that we should take a dual approach. We need to tackle labour market and mental health aspects together uh, and, and see them as, as a whole and see young people as a whole, not simply just these two entities that we need to address um, on their own. And there are some welcome initiatives from the government, for example, Kickstart uh, running till 2021, and we would welcome an extension to that because this is focused on young people specifically, uh, getting them back into work. However, some of the other initiatives such as Restart, which is fashioned on the work programme from the previous financial crisis, was effective, but not as effective for those people with mental health problems who will need much more tailored support. Um, and in terms of mental health, uh, it's welcome that mental health will be a key priority area for the government's recovery plan. Um, and we emphasise that you know, improving access to treatment and prevention for those who are furthest away um, from that um, is, is really important. But also we need to think about the root causes. Poverty, for example, being a, a key risk factor for mental health problems. So we need to really address the root problems as well. Thank you for your time. Great. Thank you very much indeed. Uh... When, as you say, what we're really saying is there are two big problems, the uh, falls in labour market outcomes for young people and increases in prevalence of mental health problems amongst young people and that those have both been growing and that they are interacting with each other in ways that we don't spend enough time um, focusing on. So that's what we're here to talk about. Now, I'm going to hand over to Alistair, who, as well as doing everything I said at the beginning, has written 17 books, which is excessive, some would say, and uh, one of which, which is a memoir on depression. So, Alistair, over to you. Thank you, Torsten. And it's a memoir on depression, which is out in paperback this week. All right, all right, move on. There you go. So, uh, well, thanks for that. That was That's actually really interesting. I'm, and I'm very, very glad that you're doing this as well, because I think that this is an issue that has had far too little attention uh, during the, the, the pandemic. 
Uh, I remember when Matt Hancock was Theresa May's health secretary, he regularly said that mental health was, was a priority, he regularly did things about it, said things about it, and I think we've gone, we've gone backwards uh, since Boris Johnson took over. I'd also like to say, I think it's important to understand, work does not guarantee happiness. Uh, if it did, then given that I've never had a day of work in my life, I would not have very long and enduring bouts of depression from time to time. And equally, um, it's not guaranteed that unemployment, low pay, insecurity will create mental health problems. However, there is a very obvious however, and that is they are often linked. And I think it's, it's good that you've, you've set out the, the, the data showing that, that potential link between uh, unemployment, low pay, insecurity and so forth with uh, mental health conditions, particularly amongst young people. Um, and also just to sort of add, add in a, a couple more um, pieces of data, you, you probably saw last week the ONS that there'd been you know, a huge rise, particularly among uh, young women. Uh, now we, we've known for a while that young men, suicide the biggest killer uh, of young men under 35 still. Um, and I think if there was any other medical condition where you said that's the biggest killer, uh, we would do far more to try to do something about it. So m far more reporting of depressive symptoms, but far less going to see a doctor, far less going trying to get therapy. Not least, I'm afraid, because I think that people are discovering that when they do discover they have symptoms of, of, of mental ill health, it's very, very hard to get services quickly unless you are pretty well healed and of course you've got the Royal College of Psychiatrists have, have warned and I know that you know this Torsten that sometimes organizations have to kind of you know hype an issue to get the attention that it needs and deserves but I don't think they're far wrong in warning that the uh, the, 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 the mental ill health could be the second pandemic uh, resulting from from COVID-19 and funny enough I was at a meeting yesterday you'll be very impressed by this team me uh, Owen Patterson, Tory MP, whose wife sadly took her life last year, Richard Bergen, Labour MP, not always on the same side of Labour arguments as I am, uh, mine, Samaritans, others, and we had a meeting with the DCMS minister about the online harms bill, uh, and what was interesting was that there was a presentation by officials of the data of mental ill health and particularly suicide through COVID, and they seemed very pleased that there hadn't been this predicted spike um, and at, at which point about 10 hands, raised hands, went simultaneously, all of us wanting to make the point that if you go back to the global financial crisis, which Rishi mentioned, that the real mental health fallout uh, came sometime afterwards as things were getting back to normal. Um, so I think we have to be very, 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 very cautious, particularly as there is going to be so much unemployment potentially uh, coming down the track. And I also think it's important, I don't like this idea that people keep saying we've got to try and get back to normal. I think in so many ways we don't want to get back to normal because a lot of the problems that are being exposed by COVID, they're problems that we should have been addressing much, much earlier. So, you know, for example, I think the, the acceptance, I don't think we've ever, as a country, including when we were in power, I don't think we've ever fully accepted the scale or the importance of uh, mental ill health and just how widely it goes. Now, you mentioned uh, that I've been doing Good Morning Britain this week, and one of the many, many arguments I've had with um, the person in whose chair I was sitting, uh, Piers Morgan, is, is actually about mental health, because he is of the view, or at least he's of the, this is what he has said to me when we've been debating this in, in public, that there's a real danger that people like me going out banging on about how important it is to be open about this uh, and, you know, and, and what he calls all the sort of celebrities coming on and thinking that, you know, a mental illness is a sort of new must have accessory that they've got to sort of show off in Hello magazine, that somehow that's actually creating mental ill health as though talking about it is actually making more people liable to uh, to, to report it. Now, and I just think that is completely and utterly wrong. I think what is actually happening that may play into the, the figures that Rushi set out is actually, and I think it's a good thing, that the younger generation is tends to be far, far more open, both about their feelings and about illness of the mind. Whereas my generation, 
your generation, Torsten, I think we, you know, we, we're way behind that. Um, and I think so. I think it's a good thing. But I think it's worth bearing in mind that if you were to poll people in their 40s, 50s and 60s as to whether they were suffering from mental Ill health, a lot of them would say no, when in fact the truth was was yes. So I don't think we have a, a fully uh, accurate picture. And on the, um, the where, where we kind of go coming out of COVID, I think the one good thing on this that comes out of COVID, at least there is an understanding, I think, for most people of what mental ill health might feel like. I've met so many people who sort of say, you know, I have actually felt a bit anxious for the first time in my life. I have got really kind of, particularly during January and February, I have really felt something inside me that is maybe worse than just feeling a bit glum and, and I have been a bit more worried. So at least we know, and that's what I mean about not going back to, to normal. I want to go forward to a place where actually we all feel that we can be as open about that as we are about, you know, having a broken leg, having a cold, having asthma, having diabetes, whatever it might be. And I think for me, that one of the most important things, and bear in mind, I did an event with the Scouts this morning about mental health. And of course, the theme of Mental Health Awareness Week is nature. And we were talking about the outdoors and all that stuff. But actually, the Scouts, they've laid off over 100 people this year because of the loss of funding through the pandemic. Now that's, that's I think their total workforce is something like 380 and they've lost over a hundred of them. Um, and that's a lot of people being, you know, young people, committed people who've been in good paid jobs and they're suddenly out there. And the guy, the CEO was saying that, you know, I said, well, what follow up have you given in terms of support for them? He said, well, we're now, you know, we're now struggling to kind of deal with the people we've still got and to grow the organization and so forth. So these problems, I think are going to grow across, across the public sector, the private sector, and of course the uh, the voluntary sector. And tonight, it's because uh, it's Mental Health Awareness Week, I'm doing a load of these things. And tonight I'm doing one at the BBC, not, not for broadcast, but as employers. And I think this is really interesting as well, because you take an organization, I mean, you know, Resol Resolution Foundation, you, you've got a pretty good reputation. You, you never sort of want for attention. You work away in a positive, react, pro proactive way. BBC, big organization, uh, lots of young people, um, sort of making making it, a lot of them in first jobs, really trying to make it in a very competitive environment inside an organisation which is facing massive financial problems, real challenges from technological change and a government that is putting it under sustained attack. And they've asked me to go along uh, because they actually, you know, they've noticed there's been a big uptick in the reporting of mental ill health through this. So this is, if you imagine that happening there and at the Scouts and at some of the businesses I've been at. So... And I want to close just by saying, I do think that business as employer is absolutely fundamental to this. I mean, the, the, the book I did write about depression is very much about, you know, what we can do for ourselves, what we can do with the family, colleagues and so forth. But I think the other two big parts of this are government. And it won't surprise you to know I'm not convinced this government gets this agenda. And the other one is business. And I feel that business is getting this agenda a lot better. And I think one of the reasons for that does go back to the financial crisis. A lot of big businesses had suicide during the uh, pandemic. The, if you go to the Bank of England, for example, uh, they have, I beg your pardon, the stock exchange, they have a desk on the first floor when you go in, which they've not touched since a guy whose desk that was took his own life. And it wasn't during the crisis, it was thereafter. And it's just a reminder to people that this is what happens when you let your mental ill health get out of control. And, you know, some of the banks literally had people jumping off the building and, you know, put to one side, even the kind of just the human cost of that, they understand as well, there's a massive financial cost as well. So I think we have to win the argument that for these companies, for any organization, it's not just about the human suffering, which is massive. It's actually about long-term, if we can get proper parity between physical and mental health, we will have a stronger economy. Businesses will have better, happier, healthier workforces, and we'll be in a better place. Right. And final point, Torsten, sorry. I did a, a, an, all, a, an all staff event with the Bank of Ireland recently, and the chief executive, Francesca McDonough, she opened the event by saying, if there's one thing we've learned through this pandemic is that we all have to look after our mental health and we're all vulnerable. And she said, from this day forward, the number one priority for this organization is the mental health and well-being of our employees. Ahead of profit, ahead of contracts, ahead of everything, because if we don't do that, then we're not going to be able to become the business that we want to be. That is leadership. And I also think that is where we need to be as a, 
as a country. It's where we need to be, where the government is, should be, and they're miles off it. And it's where I think we, as a society, we need to start thinking in that way. Great. And that's a nice, uh, that's a great story to end with. Almost enough to make me forgive you lumping you and I in the same generation in the middle of that uh, talk. But, you oh, know, I'm, step, I'm a very forgiving person. I did not say that, Torsten. I oh, said your well, generation or mine. I I you can try spinning this, but I heard very clearly what was going on. Now, apart from us rowing, Louise, it's over to you. And make sure you come off mute so we can hear you. There you go. Can you hear me? Brilliant. Yes. Okay, great. Go. Great. Um, so thank you very much. And, and thank you to um, the Resolution Foundation and to Rookman for a fantastic um, report, very exhaustive and really important um, findings in there and important policy implications. Um, my presentation or my response will be probably kind of slightly different to um, Alistair's one. Uh, my background is in research um, and I do mental health research. So um, I, I would just want to kind of um, bring in three different points um, from a, um, a research point of view, you know, on mental health and on employment as well. Um, one thing that I, I wanted to raise um, is about the impact of COVID on mental health and, and just kind of really emphasizing that the evidence um, that we have so far is really complex and it's really complex to process. I wish I could say kind of, yes, there's a huge effect of COVID, you know, on people's mental health. Um, I, would, I would use a more kind of careful approach that the findings do vary by subgroup uh, of the population, by time, by various types of mental health uh, problem. But if there is one thing which seems to be consistent across all the evidence is that young people seems to be disproportionately kind of affected by, um, by the situation. So that is something um, really important to consider. Um, another thing or another kind of factor that came out really strongly from um, recent research on the effect of COVID on mental health is probably the disproportionate increase of problems in other groups as well. Um, so you have ethnic minority groups, um, which seems to be more affected uh, by the um, by the COVID. Um, deprived and crowded areas um, also seem to be um, more affected by the impact of, of the pandemic. So, and this is something which is not new. It's always been there, but I think that this hasn't been addressed properly. And the effect of the pandemic has just kind of have amplified this, the urgency of, you know, kind of tackling those issues. And, and we need to tackle those issues, not just in the way that we approach our research, but also how we, we want to um, target policy um, interventions. Um, if there are other points to consider in terms of um, the impact of COVID on mental health um, is probably the fact that we have to be careful and making sure that we do distinguish when we look at those surveys of, you know, symptoms of mental health problems across time. I think it's really important that we distinguish normal response to a threatening global situation versus mental health problem induced by severe and persistent persistent stress. So in some ways, I think that we need really to have longitudinal approaches that will kind of continue to monitor rates of those symptoms um, to see whether there's really a, a, an important and significant impact on the pandemic on um, populations mental health problems. So in some ways, you know, I think it's normal to see an increase in the symptoms, given the situation last year was so threatening and so unexpected, and we didn't know. Um, I think that the important point that we have to kind of monitor now is to see whether we kind of um, see a reduction in those symptoms in the long term. You know, we're still in it now. Or whether, you know, the symptoms will um, will kind of remain high. So, so we need to distinguish normal response versus kind of um, mental health uh, problems that may need professional um, attention. Um, the other point that I wanted to make was that we don't have evidence just yet that there is a direct effect of COVID on people's mental health, similar to the way that research indicates an effect of the virus on our sense of smell or taste or on our respiratory functions or levels of inflammation. So, 
and and I'm saying not yet because there could well be an effect, a direct effect of the, the virus on the brain, which kind of affects mental health problems, but we don't have this evidence just yet. The increase in the symptoms that we've uh, currently kind of see probably is due to um, an effect of COVID on live circumstances, isn't it? I mean, um, the virus have increased kind of risks for depression or levels of depression via lots of different factors in the past year, including kind of bereavement, concerns for a loved one, limited kind of social interaction, uh, job loss, you know. Um, so I think that in the long term, once again, we will need to monitor the impact of COVID on those kind of social systems, the social circumstances which have an effect on mental health uh, problems. So um, it is really important that we monitor, you know, the effect of COVID on employment, on education, um, and on um, socializing, you know, the way that people can reach out and have this kind of natural network of people to help us go through difficult um, situations. So these are kind of things that we really need to monitor in the long run. Um, and, and I think that the impact of COVID on measures of austerity will have a long term and a lasting effect. Um, so I think um, it is really important to um, to kind of consider that beyond the lockdowns and beyond, you know, the pandemic, you know, there will be a lasting effect of COVID on those systems, which will have a rebound effect on people's mental health. And, and when I talk about um, mental health, I think it's really important to uh, be careful with our language. I'm not just talking about mental health problems that require kind of professional help, but also kind of variation of different symptoms within the population. So that is really important um, as well. And once again, those measures of austerity will probably make it difficult for everyone, but they will make it especially difficult for people who are already vulnerable to the de develop mental health uh, problem. So that would be probably my first, um, the point that I want to make about mental health, the impact of COVID, you know, on mental health. But the other point I would want to, um, to add to the discussion would be some of our research that we did pre-COVID on NEAT. So people who are not in education are... Um, or working, I always kind of struggle with that acronym, uh, not in education or employment. Employment or training, yeah. Thank you. Thank you. That's all, right. that's all, that's all we're here for. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> Great. Uh, so that's a, a study that was published in 2016. And those findings are um, using a nationally representative group of young people who were age 18 in 2012 and 2014. 14. So that is definitely kind of pre-pandemic, you know, we had no idea what was ahead of us. Um, and that group was followed since they were age um, five. So it's a longitudinal cohort and it's a group of 2,232 people. So it's not a large group like the ones that we have these days. The advantage of that group is that we have very detailed measure of whatever we collect. We have detailed measure that was collected as part of an interview and we have a very good retention rate as well. So part participants still kind of uh, take part in our study. And in our study, we had 239, so 11 or nearly 12% of the group who were neat. And um, to provide a bit of context to it, so 2012, 2014 is kind of shortly after the financial, financial crisis in 2008. And what we uh, we thought that they were in uh, in the worst kind of labor market in generations, but again, we didn't know what was ahead of us. And what we wanted to know was to see the relationship between need status and work related self perception. You know, either kind of um, commitment to work, how much these um, the people who were need kind of um, were actively kind of looking for job, their work skills, and how optimistic they were about the economy. And the other question that we asked was whether the um, uh, people who were neat had elevated rates of mental health problems and substance abuse, e both currently, but also in the past. And what we've shown was that the majority of the people who were uh, neat um, at you know, when they were age 18, between 2012 and 2014, they were really committed to the idea of work. So 
similarly to those who were not neat in that sample. So they, uh, you know, they considered that having a job was really important for them, that um, this is something that they, they were kind of really aiming for in their life. And they were similarly trying to find a job compared to those who were not neat. So they were not lazy. They were really kind of actively engaging in finding a job, but they really felt hampered by their low skill levels and especially their soft skills. So they didn't feel that they were um, uh, leader enough or you know, good at problem solving, and they were more pessimistic about their chances of getting ahead. Um, one of the important findings that we um, we observed was um, neat youth um, had substantial mental health problems both prior and concurrently. Um, or currently. So they had elevated rates of depression, anxiety, substance use problems, and also conduct problems. But even when they were age 12, they had elevated problems, mental health problems compared to those who were not neat at age 18. So they had elevated rates of depression, ADHD, conduct problems, substance use, and also self-harm. Um, and when you look at that group, the 239 participants who were neat when they were age um, 18, well, half of them already had mental health problems when they were um, 12. And it will not be surprising, as Rukman kind of highlighted in her presentation, that those association goes both ways. So um, stress of wanting to work but being able to can be harmful for mental health problems. But also there is a reality that employers kind of want to kind of hire healthier people. Um, so, you know, it, it's really kind of a both way um, uh, um, association. Um, we didn't find any difference for men and women, differences for men and women, except for anxiety, where there's only the men in the neat group who were more likely to experience um, anxiety. So we did kind of provide a series of recommendations, which kind of are completely aligned with, you know, Rookman's and your report, um, you know, the conclusions. So uh, I can only emphasize um, those recommendations, and which is based on the study that was completely pre-pandemic. And the final point I just want to make quickly was maybe the idea. So um, I really love the title of your um, of your report, Double Trouble. And I maybe want to kind of maybe raise the uh, possibility of thinking about a triple trouble. Um, because if there is something that hasn't um, been mentioned and that was not the, the aim of the report, but is the topic of loneliness. Um, so. Um, I also study loneliness in that group of people who were age 18, and we were looking at the profile of people who felt lonely, you know, in that age group, um, again in 2012 and 2014, between those two years. And um, of course, we found lots of mental health problems associated with loneliness, but very surprisingly, we found there was a strong association with being neat. Um, so that was um, interesting. Um, and it, we find exactly the same thing that we found for mental health problems, that um, they rated themselves lower in terms of their personal attribute, but they had similar kind of level of practical skills. Um, and they were actively engaged in finding a job, but they were less optimistic about their chances of, of living in, in, you know, succeeding in life. And one thing that we found that was um, really interesting was that loneliness was not associated with socioeconomic background, which of course being neat and having mental health problems are, you know, so we found more mental health problems and more need in um, lower socioeconomic um, status in terms of the, the family socioeconomic status. We don't find this association for loneliness, but we do find that people who feel lonely at age 18 are more likely to be neat. So loneliness could be a force, a downward kind of force uh, when we talk about kind of social mobility. So, and we know quite well as well that COVID has impacted level of loneliness, especially in that group of, of young people. So um, I would also kind of uh, mention that we keep loneliness in our radar if we consider employment, mental health problems. I think that loneliness could be there, you know, as um, a, a force that can increase that link. Great. Thank you very much. Well, not great, Louise. Most of that was very depressing, but thank you very much for uh, uh, those um, 
those comments now we've got lots of questions coming in so first of all uh, i think what we'll do is break up the conversation into digging into the data and what's been going on and then come on to like what should we what should we do about it so then um, before we do that there's a you've been voting on a poll while we've been banging on so we're going to bring up the results of that poll okay so here we go so the um so Brooklyn, i'm going to ask you to come in and explain this in a second which one is right here so this is we didn't cover this in the presentation but in the report itself we dig into splits by income uh, of people so come on Brooklyn, what's the answer people look people are medium pessimistic on this poll what's the truth well i could i could share my screen and actually show you the show you the chart you just want to sort of i think just tell us tell us the answer because we've got lots of questions to get through it, it was over 60 percent it's over sixty percent. Okay, and that is pretty staggering. So sixty percent of those on the lowest income is, that, is it young people on the lowest income or the lowest income in general? Young people on the lowest income had registered in April. We should say that April was yeah. the, peak, was the April. peak of people reporting, but still, I mean, it's a staggeringly large. And at one level, it's not surprising because most of us have probably felt something like that at some point over the last uh, year. But still, it's pretty um, surprising. Right. Let, let's dig into um, what has been. Um, what has been going uh, on over the past? I'm going to bring up some of the questions that you have um, uh, been asking. So what one of you is asking, let me pull up the right one. Uh, here we go, right, which is a basically the distinction, the, there's a gender distinction issue, and then there's the, the ethnicity um, issue that we see coming up in the data. So Roman, do you want to take this one in terms of what we've seen during COVID on those, uh, those um, uh, disparities? Yeah, so in terms of um, young women, um, they've been much more likely to experience um, symptoms at diagnostic levels, um, and they've seen a, a bigger increase than men. Um, and in terms of uh, ethnicity, any, anyone who is Black, Asian, or minority ethnic has seen an increase, but there's not been as stark a, a difference with, with white young people. There has been less of a, a change over time. Okay. Um, so, yeah, so I think, I think for women, it's definitely been a, a worse pandemic in terms of mental health. That's great. Does Alatra, like as a as a bigger picture question. So, one thing I wrestle with in the literature on the research side on the mental health space is, at one level, it documents this just like really traumatic rise in prevalence of mental health problems over the course of this century. And as Rutman showed powerfully at the beginning, the the rise is very is, is very focused amongst young people who go from being having the lowest rates of mental health problems to the highest by the time we get to the crisis. And the literature is very for the reason lots of the reasons that louise set out is very doesn't want to come to a firm conclusion because the data doesn't provide us with very clear answers of exactly what is causing this yeah. but in, but for those of us like in the policy world thinking about what's to be done it's obviously just like very traumatic to see a big problem a lack of certainty on what the answer is and it's hard not to think back to kind of tobacco smoking in the early days of people saying oh we don't know exactly what's causing this so there's nothing to be done and then we find ourselves half a century later before we do anything so how you know one what do you think is going on like why, mm -hmm. why are the numbers go, going up so much mm -hmm. you know um, and <coughs> we'll come on later to what we do about it but what is going on insofar as you can tell us with the limited research that exists well i the short answer is i don't know and i think it's a real problem because the look i think we can all guess i mean a lot of the 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 commentary and and i think some of the research is a lot of the research is looking at trying to work out what is the impact of the, the changing technological landscape upon every aspect of our life? And the one that gets a lot of focus in relation to, I think, young women and anxiety in particular is social media. Um, that does seem to fit to some extent. I think that um, young people growing up feeling pressures that our generation, Torsten, never really had to, had to worry about, um, I think that, and I've seen, you know, I've seen that in my own children. I can see that there's, there's, there's something very, very different going on that I don't think they or we fully understand. And then I think the second thing is that, th this is a point I alluded to earlier, I do think that their willingness in the main to be more open means that they are reporting and identifying. And, you know, again, I see with my daughter and her friends, they talk about how they feel all the time. And I think that's a good thing. I think it's a good thing. But I also think they become very conscious of each other's, of wanting to feel as the best one of them is feeling. And then I see them getting very low when that is not happening. And, you know, 
it's really good that she's got an amazing sort of circle of really good friends, but I can see situations where that itself becomes a, an additional pressure. I also think that we're now in an era where you, there's just so little certainty about the future uh, in terms of work, in terms of how the economy is gonna pan out, in terms of what the country feels like, in terms of social trends, everything moves so much faster than it used to do. And I do worry in the mental health agenda that we're, we're kind of, I sort of worry that we're already, this totally goes to your point about smoke, we're already trying to wrestle with a problem that is probably already out of date, and we're not really focused on the one that is probably going to have the, the bigger impact long term. But I think it's all wrapped up in this just a pace of techno technological change that we just do not understand. Yeah, that, we definitely don't understand it. I've, God knows how my my kids are not yet teenagers, but I have no. I, I intend to just blindly panic at the point at which they start uh, trying to use technology properly because the the, li the literature is like disaster at telling you what the level of impact is. So they, anyway, like Louise, hopefully this is a slightly easier question. <laughs> it's, it's not really looking at it, but there's a question coming up on the screen now, which is basically. What do I think, and you partially answered this in your question, but what was it specifically about the COVID crisis that has made it? Because as Alistair says, like we did see in the financial crisis some problems growing for mental health, and we saw suicides rising afterwards, not just amongst bankers, but just as. But what what is that so bad this time? Loneliness, you've hinted at being a big part, but what else? Um, well, it's funny because you kind of say this time. I mean, this is something that. I mean, this is the first time I, I I live or I go through something like this, you know. So, <laughs> okay, all right. Okay, forget this time. Why, why is COVID so rubbish? Like yeah, exactly. for our mental health. Okay. <laughs> well, I think. So I think that yes, my point is that um, I think that COVID has affected our life, you know, completely, completely in all different ways. You know, we were limited to stay at home, not being able to see our friends, not being able to work. Uh, we couldn't go, you know, and do our grocery shopping. So I think that it has shaken the real foundation of the way that we live and the way that we interact with people. Um, and furthermore, then, you know, at first we thought, oh, this will last for maybe three weeks, four weeks, you know, and then you know, we started losing jobs, not being able to kind of, and everything kind of started to unfold. Um, so I think that the the impact of COVID on mental health is really about making life more difficult in the first instance, um, you know, and, and let's not kind of um, ignore bereavement, <clears throat> you know, for a vast majority of people who lost, you know, loved one during this uh, period. But also we can reach out to the people that we usually kind of socialize with, you know, to kind of being able to share issues. And, and when you think of it, maybe if I experience something, I will talk to a friend, you know, who's doing well, and then she will help me and vice versa. When she has something, I will, I will help her. But then everyone was kind of going through a rough time. <clears throat> so I think that the natural resources that we usually have to deal with levels of stress, well, it was not available anymore. And even if you did manage to speak to somebody legally, none of us have had anything to say for a year because no one's done anything. Yeah, so it's more like, how have you been this week? And it's like, well, pretty similar to last week, to be honest, and it was pretty crap. Like, also, yeah. can, I, can I just yes, jump in very on, briefly? So. I did an event recently where, um, I, I wish I could remember her name because I'm sure Louise would know her, but she was an Italian um, psychiatric research, uh, academic. And she'd done some re research with her and her, she was explaining how for babies and young children growing up, uh, trauma or massive change in their lives actually changes the way that their brains, how they, the shape of them, the way they operate. And she said, this is actually going to lead to mm. a change in the brain of the next generation. So for example, just to give you a couple of examples, seeing your parents wearing masks will change the relationship with your parents. Um, not being encouraged not to run to grandparents rather than to mm. run to them, not seeing other children. She said it's, that is going to be, she said, a really big problem down the track. And I think the other thing that's, that's been unique about this, and actually Louise indicated this, is I think this is the first event in history that has universally touched every single person on the planet. I can't think of anything else. The world wars didn't environmental catastrophes that we've had haven't this this one has actually touched everyone now that ought to be able to make it easier to build a sense of global resilience but because we're in this wretched nationalist populist authoritarian era Alistair, Alistair. the opposite is happening oh, i mentioned brexit no, shush. 
that is not today's topic you've got to march you can, once you can't once you're out of social distancing you can go marching but today's not that day okay. uh the um right um uh Robin, here's a question um uh, for you on this which is just gets at this students issue and it's a wider question about your the data that you use in the project but just more broadly I think it's worth us just reflecting on how um, how students and the chances of people being students slash working as students uh, has changed over time do you want to come in on that yeah so um, student, students obviously could increase their participation so young people have increased their participation in higher education um, coming into the crisis um, but in terms of mental health um, we can see a shift in the last few years in terms of a risk of mental health problems. So I think since 2010, 2011, um, there's been a change in who we'd expect to have mental health problems. And students before were not at risk at all. And now they have these added pressures of tuition fees and uh, you know, juggling multiple jobs. However, saying that, those are probably also the groups who uh, perhaps would prefer to be in more sort of atypical types of work because of the flexibility it serves um, to their lives. Um, but they also could struggle um, because those types of work are associated with mental health problems. So it, it's a complex picture when it comes to students. Um, and that is that's a group of interest for the project going forward. But yeah, they're definitely more at risk than they were before. One of the this is more of a like wider social trend. But one thing that's surprised me in the data over the last few years when we looked at it is the the death of people working while they are teenagers or students it's gone from being normal to do some work at weekends or while you to basically no students doing any like it's almost the Saturday job is basically gone now now some of that's to do with employers don't want the faff of having young people around they, um, uh, but a lot of it does appear to be to do with either parental or self your own pressure on students to do well in education being a much more dominant force than it was and there must be some relationship like that pressure cannot have zero effect on how we all um how we all feel I mean, and we're seeing that at the student level now now i want to i'm going to bring up a second poll for you all to vote on in this last uh 10 minutes and then we're going to turn to what we do about uh this mess the um right so okay so the question here is basically and the alistair and louise you're going to give us your view on this as well and but don't let your voting on the poll be biased by what louise and alistair said we want your honest view so look here's the question we've got a big problem emerging on mental ill health amongst young people during this crisis what's going to happen next is it going to turn out to be temporary and you know as rookman's chart showed you we did see some improvement in mental health in the phases of this crisis where we return to normality so Will it mainly go away as we end, exit the pandemic? Or secondly, it will last for a significant number of young people, they, um, but we'll, we will do lots of in policy to help deal with that problem. Or will it last, uh, but we won't do very much about it and we'll just be dealing with this for the, for the coming decade. So you can all go on Slido and vote on that while we then dig into, um, let's, let's now step in and dig into like the, the what we do about this. Now, Here's one way to think about this, which is there's obviously lots of lots of different ways in which people have agency into this problem. So it, the education sector, employers, which we've touched on, uh, the government, and then us all as individuals and groups. So why don't we go through those in turn? And Louise, why don't you start on education, given that you're now and again educating some of these. You know, <laughs> what, what's the role? For, what's the role for education in this challenge? We haven't really touched on schools very much here at all. Yeah. Um... Ooh. Ooh. Oh, oh. Um, I think I think sorry um, I think perfectly. I think that um, um, I think that it will be important to educate um, young people in terms of um, how increase their level of employability especially if they come with mental health problems so I think that it would be really really important to to touch on this while we kind of tend to provide mental health services for those who have kind of uh, problems um, it will be interesting to see I think in response to the pandemic how the education system will adjust and how people you know who kind of really suffered because of their education will be able to kind of reintegrate you know the education system and and what impact will that have on employment um, later on you know whether there will be an effect uh, of poor education or disrupted education uh, on a generation of young people and how that will affect employment yep that sounds um that sounds true Alistair why don't we come to employers next because you were doing quite a, you were going to giving us some reasons for optimism on employers being serious about um, 
looking after the mental health of their employees. But can I just push you a bit, which is if you think about the workplaces you were talking about and the workplaces that I hear saying the kind of things you were talking about, they are overwhelmingly professional and they're also the upper paying end of professional uh, workplaces. Whereas if we look at the incidence of mental health, ill health, it is overwhelmingly higher amongst lower earners. The problem is the problem, although it, it sometimes, you know, Piers Morgan may talk about it as if it's kind of a upper middle class problem that yuppies basically talk about having mental health mm -hmm. problems. But actually, if you look at who says they have <laughs> mental health problems in surveys, it's lower income, lower yeah. earners that have it. Sure. So are we sure it's the right employer? Uh, it, not it's not the right employers, but <laughs> are we sure we don't need to get to other employers, too? Yeah, but the reason I mentioned the Bank of England, uh, Bank of Ireland was in relation to that, that point about leadership. I think if. If big business organizations are showing leadership, I think that will have an effect. Look, you see, the truth is, in, on the employment front, you see some absolutely extraordinary um, and positive and innovative uh, approaches. And you, and you see stuff that makes you think we're still in the dark ages, including the most extraordinary places. I, I recently did an event at an NHS trust speaking to the staff. And a nurse came up to me at the end and basically she said I was the third person she'd ever told that she was bipolar because she said that she knew for sure that if she said that to any of her colleagues or her boss, she would never ever get promoted again. I said, you, you must be kidding me. She said, no, I absolutely know that because I've seen it happen. And, you know, so we're talking, we're talking about the dark ages sometimes being in the places where you would least expect it. And, but I think that the it, it, cultural change, I think does come from leadership and government has to sort of be part of that. But I think, you know, this idea of, of spreading best practice. And, you know, the reason I do I go out to quite a lot of these, these companies is to see the ones that are doing really, really well. And some of the ideas are so simple. It's things like, I was at a place recently where they had a network of first, uh, of mental health, health first aiders within each part of the organization who then became the mental health network. And they were like a sort of a human resources department, but with humanity. Um, and and like a humane you know, human resources department. Yeah, they were. They, they, they were all doing different okay. jobs. That's, your, that's your next book done. That's the like that, I think that the change. That's that's why I'm reasonably optimistic, and I see that. I think that the next generation. I think. You, I think the other thing that might be in this in in um, Rookman's survey and the findings she's got. What might be there as well is that the younger generation is not going to put up with this idea that we don't talk about it, that we can't, we don't have the right to have it raised, that we don't have the right to be better to, looked after. But my partner, Fiona, who you know, Torsten, she, we did a talk last night and she said that, um, you know, when I was having a breakdown in the 80s, she went to see my boss and said, look, he's, up, he's, he's, having, a, he's having a mental breakdown. He's just in a very, very bad way. And, 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 the, and the editor said, oh, don't, don't talk, you know, don't be so ridiculous. He's just a bit, you know, he's just a bit sort of, excessive at times and you know a week later I was in I was in you know a psychiatric hospital so I don't think that would happen today I could be wrong but I don't think that would happen in the same way I think that's probably that is probably um true Go, going this is your one chance to have a, a plug of your um your book which is out in paperback and available in all good and also bad stores and Kindle they, and, and available on Kindle for those that don't want their paper uh, to destroy. But, but like on the individuals, so we're going to come on to government in a second, Rookman. I've got two questions to you on that from the audience. But on individuals and like us as collectives in our lives, in families and friendship groups, what, what are the lessons from your book for what we all do coming out of this crisis? Given that we are now allowed to see our friends and talk to them and we have got something to tell them that isn't just like mm. I sat at home, did a Zoom quiz and it was depressing. Well, I think the first thing is to understand is, is to have a proper understanding of the importance of those relationships that actually for all the people that we know and the acquaintances, etc. I think COVID has shown that, you know, you, you have to be able to rely on the people that you really, really trust. So really, they are the relief. You know, I have this thing, I call it FFF, Fiona family friends. They're the only people that really matter. I don't care what other people think about me. Colleagues, if I'm working with them, but then once we move on to something else, you know, unless they remain friends, then, you know, I don't worry too much about them either. And then I think this sort of, you know, I think we all need purpose. I think that's the other thing about COVID. We all need purpose. That, as you, as, as Rookman said, that often comes through work. Um, and then I think it's the fundamentals. You know, you do need to understand the link between your physical and your mental health. And you do need to, you know, eat and drink well 
exercise, look after your sleep. Uh, you do need to have to understand that this goes back to the social media point that it really isn't healthy to be constantly obsessing about what's on your phone, what's on Facebook, what's on Instagram and all that. It really isn't the best way to live. I have this motto, listen to read books, not newspapers, listen to music, not the news. And so I mean, there's loads of things we can do. Do you think that might be a life phase thing? So you weren't saying that at the age of 35. I, no, it's totally a life face thing. <laughs> okay, but my point is that I know the, re- this way. <laughs> the reason I wasn't doing that at 35. I mean, I, I was always passionate about music and stuff, but I wasn't, you know, it was because of the nature of the work I was doing. Yeah. So basically, we shouldn't, no one should work in politics. It's very bad for your mental health. Well, I mean, the, the moment. Um, politi- oh, right. Okay. I, 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 I walked into that. I shouldn't have done that. Okay. That was stupid. Right. Now, I totally walked into that. Right. Rockman, there, there's two questions here that I'm going to bring up together because the, the, the last one's for Rockman on the government. So the first is about, you know, what do we know from history about employment programs and mental health and what do we do about it? And the second one, which is here as well, hopefully, right, which is basically what do you do about non-health departments? So DWP is the one relevant to the question before, but more broadly about how government as a whole, maybe I'll come to Louise and Alistair's last words on that, which is how does government as a whole, rather than just the Department for Health, basically wrestle with this? So why don't you take the first one, which is, uh, what about employment programs? And then I'll come to Louise and Alistair for the last words on the rest of government. Yeah, I think I'll just reiterate what I said in the in the presentation, because this is something we're going to really dig into in the rest of the programme. Um, but, you know, existing programmes which are resurfacing in the in the during this crisis, such as Restart, you know, based on the work programme, they are effective and they can be effective people with mental health problems. But we know that the rate of, of them being ineffective is much higher in this group. Um, and my thought is, and you know, this doesn't necessarily, isn't necessarily backed by evidence, but you know, those who have anxiety or those who have depression, they're going to need different types of tailored support. Um, they're going to have different concerns, different barriers to getting into work, different barriers to being able to even, you know, where do I, what, how do I do a job application? Who do I speak to? Um, and we did have a, a, a chat with some young people as part of this program, which we will be doing going forward. And something that was really striking with them is I found they just didn't know how to make that first step. And that then reduced their confidence. And that is the kind of thing that affects your self-esteem and instigates mental health problems if it becomes a sort of a, a pattern of thinking. So I think it's that kind of first step for young people. And this is just my instinct that we need to address so that, you know, how do they, how do they go to the job centre and just apply for, for a job? And what, kind, what do their skills uh, allow them to do? They don't really know um, is the sense that I'm getting. So I think somehow initiatives need to give them that first step into the world of work um, and the, the right match for them, yeah. And on that, when we're thinking about it, I think it is important to say, you know, we should expect some improvement in our mental health as the economy opens up and as you all say, we get to see people again. But at the same time as that's happening, unemployment amongst young people will probably be rising in the in this autumn. And so it, some of things will get better for maybe the bulk of people, but we may get a more concentrated problem amongst those who are um, suffering from that. Now, Louise, what do, we, what do we do about the rest of government outside the Department for Health? Who we're assuming care about this a bit. Yeah. <laughs> well, I just want to say that I totally agree with what you said, that I think that for the vast majority of people, things will kind of get better with just a little bit of push, you know, things will be fine. And I think that the government tends to kind of focus on this. You know, they tend to focus on kind of global kind of programs that help, you know, those people who are struggling a bit. But I think that it will not be the case for those people who already have existing kind of vulnerabilities. For them, the situation will be made so much worse and will continue to be so much worse and they the government needs to focus in providing kind of really in-depth kind of program and services to tackle those vulnerabilities before they kind of become big problems so I think early interventions for sure early interventions for the government it's never you know, kind of really appealing because it's difficult to show the impact and that doesn't bring any votes. So, but early intervention is the most cost efficient way of solving the issues. So public health, you know, okay, yes. Um, but I think uh, mental health, for sure, there's a crisis in services, you know, um, services do not address, you know, the issues and, and for good reason that they are under-resourced. Um, so there's definitely kind of need more money in, in there and education, education as well, definitely. Great. Now let's bring up the, the, let's bring up the results of the poll and then I'll have the last word and then we will uh, wander off to our uh, day. So come on, where did you all 
uh, God, you lot are this, you, you lot are depressing about depression and its lasting uh, effects. That's pretty grim, guys. So, um, okay. I mean, obviously, we only gave you binary options, so it's all very unfair. Maybe you would have nuanced reasonableness, but that's pretty depressing, right? Alistair, you can give us your view on the poll, and what about the rest of government? And then we shall. Well, leave. I mean, the the answer to the question in the poll is it, it really does depend country by country what the policy decisions that they now take. You look at some countries. I think Germany has taken mental health seriously during the pandemic, so has New Zealand. Uh, now, it's, it's interesting, both of those countries have taken it seriously for a long time, so it was already kind of embedded and that's, and that's their approach. Yeah. But I, I think that um, one thing that I really do think, uh, what I'd like to see is actually, we, we don't actually have a mental health service in this country. We have a mental illness service. We have a mental crisis service. And that's the only time that you can be guaranteed care is, is if you sort of jump out the window um if you're sort of between feeling really really bad and jumping out the window it's very very hard for a lot of people to get now i if you had a proper mental health service i think you, you could even think about you know you've got health and social care uh, brackets not doing anything about it you've got mental health which sits there but actually if i think if we thought about it as well-being and resilience you can actually take that out of health and spread it across, you know, education. I completely agree with Louise about the importance of doing this from primary schools upwards. I think we should have mental health classroom assistance on the model that we had them uh, with the Labour government. And I think you should you, you go across sport, you go across criminal justice, you go across the prisons, you go across probation, you go across family policy. I think we need to sort of take, it sounds bizarre this, I think we need to take mental health out of health. And we need to, we need to think of it as you know, well-being, opportunity, resilience. How do we get the best out of people? That is typically Leveling ambitious. Up. Typically ambitious in its uh, in its objectives. Right. Look, I want to say um, thank you to uh, Rutman for the report and for the presentation, and to Louise and Alistair for their really interesting comments on it over the last hour. Thank you all for joining. And if we're, you know, what we're really saying is we've seen a sea change in the scale of these problems, and actually on the positive side, we've seen a sea change in the level of focus on it even over the last few years and that's very good news the problem is what we haven't had is a sea change in doing something about it and that is really what we hope to see um in the years ahead so have a good day everyone and we hope to see you at a future resolution foundation webinar soon bye thank, thank you. you thank you